Hello, welcome to Talking Europe on France 24. Today we're talking rights and welfare. And as you probably know, the EU prides itself on its reputation as a beacon of human rights. But in today's programme, we're talking about animal rights, an issue that's never gone away, but which is back in the news right now as the EU debates animal welfare in agriculture, for example, as well as the use of antibiotics in animals, as well as ways of stopping animal testing in cosmetics sold within the 28 member states. Well, one big question, why does the EU want to lead the world in animal rights and how could it go about doing so? Can laws passed here truly be enforced even on Europe's own soil, let alone beyond European borders? On our panel today, we have two MEPs who tend to agree on the need for greater animal rights, so they are from very different political families, uh, from the European Conservatives and Reformist Group, Danish MEP Jan Dorman. Thank you for being with us. Thank you. From the Greens Group, Austrian MEP Thomas Weitz. Hello. Thank you for inviting me. And uh, our external expert from the campaign group, Eurogroup for Animals, uh, the organisation's director, Reineke Hameleers. Thanks for being with us. Very good, thank you. And just to explain for the viewers, it's the, the one and only pan-European umbrella group for animal welfare, very active here in Brussels and beyond. Mm. Well, I'll just start with a first question to uh, all of my guests then. If I can just uh, come round the table and ask you briefly, uh, you know, the EU does want to be a world leader in animal welfare. Under the Lisbon Treaty, animals are recognised as sentient beings. They can't be treated as simple goods, like a lump of cheese or a table. Um, how is the EU doing at the moment, Mr Dorman? I don't think they are doing very well. Uh, it's too much a difference between the countries uh, if we are talking about animal welfare. So... We are not doing very well. We can do it much better. Mr. Weitz? Due to the fact that many citizens are concerned about animal rights, uh, there is a strong pressure also within the parliament to improve. And uh, Ms. Hamelaers? Yeah, you're very right. The EU likes to pride itself as leader on animal welfare. However, since the past eight years, we are facing a stalemate in terms of real progress uh, for animals. So there's a lot, a lot to do, uh, not only for the animals, but also to, uh, to listen to all the citizens who want to see uh, more pro progress, more improvements. Absolutely. We'll come back to public opinion a bit later on. Uh, I've got a report that I'd like to show just to illustrate perhaps one of the areas where there are difficulties for the European Union in the area of animal welfare. Uh, we've got a report about Austria, the first country in the EU to ban the production of intensively farmed battery eggs. They're not banned, however, from being sold in Austria. Take a look at this report. Drasmarkt, a small village in eastern Austria. For 50 years now, the Schlögel family has raised poultry here. After battery breeding was outlawed, they replaced the cages with floor pens. The hens can move around freely within this aviary, but not outside in the fresh air. A fair compromise for Heinz Schlögel, who now heads the family business. Initially, we disagreed with the ban. We thought it would be difficult to implement. But today I say, with God's grace, we've managed it. Floor pen breeding is a good compromise between economic priorities and ethical considerations. A compromise adopted by many of Austria's producers. Two-thirds of laying hens are ground-bred, one-third in the fresh air. A respect for animal well-being supported by citizen activists. Battery breeding of layer hens has become the prototype of animal cruelty for Austrians. The population wanted this ban and played a big role promoting it. Big distributors and the industry followed. Today it's a real success story. On Austria's supermarket shelves, there's not a box of battery hen eggs in sight. However, they're still present in certain processed products. Unfair competition, say egg producers. Local producers in Austria are better paid than before, but it is still a difficult market. Producers from other EU countries can still sell their battery-produced eggs here. And of course those eggs are cheaper, so that's still a pressure on our market. Next challenge, ensuring processed product distributors outline on the packaging how the hens they use for their eggs are bred. That way, consumers can also place animal welfare at the heart of their shopping experience. 
There we go, just one example of one of the little paradoxes within the laws surrounding animal welfare. Thomas Weitz, you're from Austria. We're just talking about Austria there. Perhaps come to you first. Um, this issue where you can have a ban in one country, but then imported eggs that get used in cakes and things like that, this seems like a perfect example of a European paradox. Uh, are these sorts of things solvable, however? First of all, Austrian producers are very lucky that Austrian consumers preferably buy Austrian products. Uh, that's why uh, our farmers can compete on the market. But in the, in the guest houses, in the restaurants, where you don't see where the products come from, uh, there's still a lot of cage eggs used. Mm. And actually, yes, it's a paradox on and uh, either we should go forward with one regulation for the whole European Union or we need to extra support the farmers that do the right thing. Reineke Hemmel is nodding there. However, I, I know that uh, when, we, when we're talking about these kind of goods, uh, those margins do mean a lot to companies. Profits mean jobs in a lot of cases. It, it's a difficult one to balance, isn't it? Well, I think that this is a perfect example of how we can move forward. So member states are taking the lead. Consumers want to get rid uh, of all the cages uh, for, the, for the laying hands. It can be done. Retailers are making huge steps. So now it's time to regulate and to provide a loving playing field and to make sure that we keep driving progress for animals. So I'm very pleased to see that Austria is taking the lead and we will push other member states and the Commission to follow. Oh, Jan Dorman, uh, some member states taking certain actions, but not all. Uh, we keep hearing about the public opinion being very much in favour of this kind of thing, retailers, mm. as you say, getting on board. Why is it then not coming through in actual legislation, in directives? Well, I would say a lot of uh, countries are different, so they don't want to make the same move at the same time, and that is a problem if we want to do something for the animal welfare. Mm. So it is a paradox that we have some countries, not just on animal welfare, but you can look at it many different things where some countries have the lead but the others don't follow. Mm. So um, that's actually the, 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 the reason why we have big problems in Europe, not just on animal welfare but all, uh, on all uh, different uh, things. So I think there we need to have a more, I think, common Europe where we think on the same way if we want to do this project uh, mm. totally. But now we have uh, too much different. I have to say, um, looking at the different groups that we have in the European Parliament, uh, yours would be classed among the more Eurocritical, at least, if not out yes. and out, Eurosceptic. There are Eurosceptic parties in your group. Um, the exact kind of parties that consistently reject these more blanket European regulations, uh, criticising red tape, hold-ups, that kind of thing. Yes, but that's... Uh, it's always a discussion on how much should Europe take the lead in all the cases, in different cases. We can talk about animal welfare, but we can also talk about taxation and all the other things. So you have to, to understand that we, we have to go into a market and see, and so long we don't have this equal, uh, I would say, competition, we'll not have the same rules, I think. Of course, animals are animals. They don't have a nationality. No, but it's important <laughs> to, to, to have countries mm. who are taking the lead and... and and where we pressure the other countries to follow. So that's for sure. Thomas Weitz? If we have a European common market on one hand and we don't have common regulations on the other hand, this creates inequality on the production scheme. So we need a common regulation for the whole European Union and we have yeah. to enforce it that everyone follows it and our systems are not so different within Europe. Yeah, but no, and I think also, I let us look at the animal case, but I think we agree on that. Animals cross borders, dead or alive, all the time. So member states can't regulate on this in isolation. There needs to be a harmonization. And of course, within that harmonization, you can uh, leave room for national differences. I think that that, that should, can easily be done. No, but but it, we need well, to have this strong common framework. Then you have this framework. result that we have now. If we, leave, if we let them have this opportunity to go further, then somebody will always be behind uh, on this uh, case. And the other problem is also, if we import X uh, from uh, other countries, how can we control that they are actually uh, having the same rules uh, like we have mm -hmm. in Europe? But that's and a very important point we should tackle, yes. of course. We need to make sure that imported products will comply with our standards. Exactly, but we don't have that today. No. We, we just make a, 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 what do I say, a trade agreement with, with other countries, but we don't follow up with uh, the rules. Mm. But it almost comes back to almost a philosophical point. Uh, we were talking about human rights uh, being enshrined in EU law at the beginning. Uh, I mean, is there a possibility that animal rights could have their own 
enshrinement in EU law in the same way, Mr. Vates? Sure, there, there, there is an, there, that's in place actually, uh, but there's some member states reluctant to really follow up to a common strategy. But it's not as detailed as the human No, record. and if I may come in here, because you're very right, it is in place. We have this very important principle of animal sentience uh, in the highest EU legislation in the treaty. Um, however, it hasn't been implemented in actual legislation. Do you think then that it does need to be absolutely spelled out for... Oh, it, no, but I mean... This is a vast subject, isn't it? It is, it is, but according to EU legislation, so the actual legislation, animals have only been described as products, as goods or commodities. So there's this gap between the treaty and the actual legislation. Mm -hmm. And the Commission had this big plan to come forward with an animal welfare framework law uh, so framework law in which this very important principle on sentience that animals are subjects could be implemented in, in actual legislation, but that hasn't happened. So this would underline national laws that they would then have to adhere to these broad lines? Yes, yeah. Do you think that's something that would be acceptable across Europe? Um, I don't think it will be so easily accepted, but, but I, I hope that many countries would uh, also have a look into implementing the, the rules, what they get from Europe, from uh, EU. Mm. Uh, today, I just see that it is a, a, too much a difference between the countries, how they are treating animals. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there, I think the Commission should be harder to, to actually go out and control each country. Are they doing uh, things on the right way? I don't think they are doing. Let's just briefly talk about public opinion, there seems to be quite a huge disparity between the way that the public seems to be massively in favour of animal mm -hmm. welfare in a general sense, and the actual law changes that we're seeing. Uh, Reineke Hamelers, what is this? Is this a clash between public opinion and industrial lobbies, perhaps? Yeah, I would say, you know, we have never seen such a ground 12 public support for animal welfare as shown in the 2015 Eurobarometer on animal welfare. But there is this discrepancy between what, what consumers and citizens want and what uh, politicians and policymakers do. So we believe it's very important uh, that citizens are being listened to and that in the next political term there will be concrete action for animals. Well, let's uh, come so to one of our politicians, mm. Thomas Weitz. Um, there is a, a lingering suspicion for many people that it is the industrial lobbies, the farming lobbies that are getting between public opinion and the law changes that the public seems to be asking for. Is that your experience? Yes, absolutely. Big parts of the public don't re really realise that we're oriented on the world market production and this is one of the causes why we have such pushy uh, industry uh, on all these regulations because if we set the regulations in the way citizens would like us to, that would mean that the uh, industry, the breeding industry, couldn't keep up uh, with the world market. Uh, and more or less, uh, the transports, you know, to transport animals for 30 hours across the continent is just not supported by the public. Uh, and the public will like us to strengthen the laws, but not only strengthen the laws, but also put in place the laws that are there already, because there's a big lack of controls on the street. Yeah? Uh, I'm doing controls uh, um, uh, with the police, together with the police. And actually, we stand there for two hours and we have one truck that we pull out of the traffic immediately. So there's no, no real controls on the street and that has to be improved. Jon Dorman, uh, this gap between public opinion and what actually happens, as you say, not just in terms of uh, laws, but in terms of implementation as well, where's that coming from? I see that that the consumers are asking for this, uh, that we are doing better. They asking for the labeling and all that, but it's not always allowed in each country to, to make a flag or, or a symbol on this packet. So I think we have to do it much better uh, as politicians also. Well, perhaps an answer could be the idea of a sort of a European label that could go on our food stuff saying this product adheres to certain European standards. Reineke Hamelaert, we'll give you the last word. Yeah, I think um, it's very important that we have mandatory method of production labelling. As we are having on the X, you know, an objective framework in which all these marketing labels can have a place, higher welfare labels. But yes, we need clear labelling and we need more transparency to consumers because they don't see uh, the wood for the trees. All right, well, uh, we have run out of time, unfortunately. Thank you all very much for your thoughts. Okay. And before we round off the show, just time for our regular check on fake news here in the EU, in Fact or Fake. This week, how one tweet, one solitary tweet, fooled many Germans into believing that their government was on the brink of collapse. Here's Frédéric Simon.
Germany's Chancellor Angela Merkel is in the middle of a fierce controversy over migration. And in mid-June, she found herself at the center of wild rumors on Twitter. They claim that her government coalition had collapsed after her Bavarian sister party, the CSU, reportedly pulled out from a decades-old alliance with her party, the CDU. The news turned out to be a hoax, however, which originated from a fake Twitter account posing as a local TV channel. But the hysteria unleashed by the fake story was very real, and it was further fueled by far-right supporters on Twitter and alarmist headlines. Eventually, the CSU was forced to deny the claim in order to bring nervous financial markets back to normal. So why did the rumor spread so easily? Well, simply because it sounded credible. Tensions over migration have reached a peak in recent weeks in Germany. The Bavarian Conservatives want migrants previously registered in other EU countries to be turned back at the German border. And they give Mrs. Merkel two weeks to find a solution with European neighbors. A serious situation indeed, but not the fake news that was circulated on Twitter. Well, that does bring us to the end of this week's programme. Thank you all very much for watching this week's edition of Talking Europe. I'd also like to thank, of course, my guest for this week's debate from Eurogroup for Animals, Director Reineke Hameleers. Thank you for being thank with you. us. Thank uh, you. We also have with us Austrian MEP Thomas Weitz from the Greens Group. Thank you for your time. And from uh, the ECR group in the Parliament, Jan Dorman from Denmark. Thank you. Thank you. Well, that's it for now. We'll see you after the news for more European news here on France 24.